Amen. Thanks, Taylor. Hey, well, good morning. Thank you for responding. Don't want to have to do that again. Good job. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're joining us from online, we're, we're glad you're with us too. Uh, we know you might be on vacation, uh, hanging out somewhere in Colorado. Um, might be dead to us inside, but that's a fine. That's fine. But uh, we're that's that we're glad you're we're, we're glad you're with us this morning. And for y'all that are here in the room, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Like Taylor said, my name's TJ, uh, and we're talking today about how, what it means to have a better confidence, uh, all because of what Jesus has done uh, for us. But um, yeah, like Taylor mentioned, this is the kind of the you know it's it's the summer. Uh, it can really be like the dog days of the summer. I remember growing up as a kid, like this time of year, it was just like, I mean, we didn't have like cable in our house. It was like, so what do we, what do we do? What do we, I think my parents were like, we really hope school starts soon uh, because we really need to get you back into a routine and rhythm. Uh, anybody else feeling that? Like, it's like, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and start school. The kids are like, no, please. But uh, parents are like, yeah, let's, get, let's get out of the house. Because, but, the, but the hard thing is, is like when it's 1,000 degrees outside, it's like, okay, well, let's come back in. Like, maybe it's not good to be outside right now, so there's really only two options. It's like either go to the pool or you just stay inside. And from a, from like, from a sports perspective, because that's where I, just, I, I live and spend most of my time, like in sports world now, it's like, yeah, there's baseball and it's like they're in the, this grind and it's like, yeah, when, okay, so playoffs get here like in a couple months. And like everybody's looking for some sort of story, right? And if you, if you, don't, follow, if you don't follow soccer, like there was a big story in, in Major League Soccer here in the United States because we actually had to go get like the best player ever to come over here to play in, in Major League Soccer. And, and so Lionel Messi, who goes by Messi, like you know you've made it when you make like when you go by one name, right? You're like, this, this, he's, he's awesome. He's, he's, he's messy. And so he, he starts his career with Inter, or, or starts his time, I guess, with Inter Miami on Friday night. And this is a huge story globally. I mean, you had LeBron, you had Kim Kardashian, like they have their phones out and they're like filming him as he's like tying his shoe and getting ready to enter into the game for like 30 minutes. The game's 90 minutes. And he's like, I can only show up for 30 minutes and I'm gonna go ahead and score a goal and we're gonna win. Like, that's how good he is. And so I can't imagine how the rest of Major League Soccer feels because they're like, he's here with us? Like, this is, this is incredible. Like, he's the best. Like, they, they're all shook. They probably, like, anybody suffer from imposter syndrome? Like, if you know what this is, you're probably like, yeah, that's me. It's, it's, it's me. Like, I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I belong up here. Like we all deal with this. And so I feel like Major League Soccer players are suffering with this, but this is not just something Major League Soccer players suffer with. It's, it's something we all kind of deal with. Because we start kind of questioning, going like, man, I, like, I, I, I'm in, this, I'm in this, uh, this high performing area and I'm producing results, but man, I, there's a lot of anxiety that starts to set in. You start feeling overwhelmed because you just don't feel like you belong. You feel like you're a poser. And you just become overwhelmed. And what happens is you start to lack confidence. Because confidence gives peace. Confidence gives this assurance that no, like it's okay. You're where you're supposed to be. And what happens, like we, we want, like we want confident people, right? Like I want, if I ever have to have surgery again, I want a confident surgeon, okay? I don't need nervous Nelly operating on my knee being like, well, I think I can figure this out. Like, no, 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 like I want to be confident when I enter into the operating room so that I know that he's gonna take care of me. All right, Dallas Maverick fans, we want confident three-point confident three shooters, am I right? I want Dak, Dak, I want Dak to be confident, okay? Like, we, come on, like, let's go. Like, we, we want confident people. And this spills over into our spiritual life because we want to be confident in how we follow Jesus. God, am I, do, am I doing this right? Like, is this what you asked? Is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this where I'm supposed to go? Again, that confidence gives assurance and it gives peace because a lack of confidence is what makes us feel overwhelmed. 
we're overwhelmed by, by what's around us. As, as parents, we're, we're, we're filled with anxiety because we're constantly trying to figure out what, like, what, 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 what activities we're supposed to put our kids in. We're overwhelmed because we just go, okay, is this, is this right? Is this, am I setting them up for success right now? Students are filled with anxiety because of the choices they need to make. They want to make sure their posts are right. They want to make sure they're applying to the right school. They want to make sure they're, they're doing all the right activities. I mean, the, the, the Gen Z, the, the, the label for them is the, is the anxious generation. What a horrible name. And so this, now this, this sense of worry because we lack confidence sets in. We read a headline and we immediately begin to just freak out. And so then we live in fear because everything seems out of control. And all this impacts our identity because we place it in the things that are actually temporary. We're just forgetful of what Christ has done. And so when unbelief sets in, we lose our confidence in the work of Christ. And what we're going to see today is we can be confident in God. We have confidence because of our great high priest. Confidence is given to us because of Jesus. But how do we know? How do we know? How do we know when we're confident in the Lord? How do we know when we're confident in the Lord. This text in, in Hebrews 10 that we're going to look at today is pretty, is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's kind of the end of this, is the, of this second uh, discourse that the, writer, uh, that the writer gives us. And so what we're going to see is that we're able to draw near. We're able to hold fast. We're able to hold fast to the gospel because it's been given to us. And we're able to stir up one another. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to read along with me. We're going to be in Hebrews 10, 19 through 39. We'll get there here in a second. But we've been walking through the book of, of Hebrews, and hopefully you've joined us in our dwell readings. We've been reading through the book of Hebrews along with Exodus, because Exodus gives a lot of context uh, to what the Hebrews writer is, is writing about. And so in chapter 9 and 10, like th this is the pinnacle of the writer's argument towards the, the, the end of that second discourse. And there's, there's some that believe Hebrews was, was a, a sermon written that, that was supposed to be delivered. I don't know how it was supposed to be delivered because if it was one time, that's a long sermon and that's a long day. So I'm glad we're not doing that. Okay, but, but here, here what he's showing us is that the Old Testament sacrificial system has served its purpose but now Christ has come and was sacrificed once and for all. Here's what he says in, in 24 and 28 of, of uh, or 24 through 28 of chapter 9. He says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But, but as it is, he has, prepared, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So Christ has fulfilled the law and he's made a way for us to access the presence of God. And we can be confident that God sees those who believe in Jesus' life, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. We're not covered by our own efforts or we're not covered by this old sacrificial system. We're, we're covered by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of bulls and goats, which is what he says in verse 4 of chapter 10. The sacrificial system wasn't pointless. The point is Jesus. And it was there as, as a reminder of their sin, but it could not take their sin away. Jesus' death takes away the punishment of sin. And so when Christ had finished, he sat down because he was done. And again, this is not a repeated 
effort. He didn't do this more than once. Our confidence is found in Jesus' work. That's why he says, that he starts off verse 19, that he starts off with therefore. Because he's looking back. He's looking back. Back. It says, because you now have this truth, based on everything Jesus has done, we now can be confident in his work. So how do we know we're confident in the Lord? Number one is we were able to draw near. We draw near. Look at 19 through 22 in chapter 10 with me. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because of everything Jesus has done, we are able to draw near to him. He took on our sin. He died in our place so that we could have a place in the presence of God. And this is continual. continual. Jesus' sacrifice is not repeated, but us entering into his presence is a repeated practice. And so the word draw or draw near, like what he's talking about, really the word is actually enter in. It's a reference to the practice of the high priest when he would enter this most holy place. And so this holy place is symbolic for the presence of God. And because of what Jesus has done through his death, we can now enter the presence of God confidently and repeatedly. And so the writer, he's used this, he's used this phrase, draw near, several times throughout, throughout the book of Hebrews. It's a, it's a minor theme of just like, just draw near. It's an invitation, draw near to God. And we draw near with a true heart or a sincere heart. We draw near with a, a full assurance, which is produced by faith. It's, it, it, this is knowing that God welcomes you into his presence. Jesus has made a way and we're accepted. We draw near with a, a pure mind. We've been, we've been cleansed of, of our unrighteousness. We draw, draw near with pure actions because now we've been, we've been purified. We've been washed. And so if you lack the confidence to enter his presence, it's because you have perhaps forgotten or you just don't know. You don't know what Jesus has done to make you worthy to enter his presence. And so what, what, what really happens is we begin to magnify our problems and our anxieties and our worries instead of magnifying the Lord. It's like the, the college kid that comes home uh, you know, from, from, from a long semester. All the worries of, uh, of tests, all the, all the worries of uh, of class and scheduling and everything that comes with, uh, comes with that college life. College is great, but there's also these other things that you're constantly having to deal with, right? You got to worry about where you're going to eat. You got to worry about how you're going to get your laundry done. Back in the day, it was like, we're still using coin machines. And I was like, all right, so do I have any quarters in my car somewhere that I could find? When you walk into your parents' home, hopefully this is your case, when you walk into your parents' home, like your anxieties and your worries just kind of melt away. Because you're in a place that where you know you feel accepted and you feel loved. And you don't have to worry about all those different things. You're taken care of in the presence of your home. And so it's the same when we enter the presence of God. When you only focus on your problems or your anxieties, your worries, you're, you're going to magnify the wrong things. And so drawing near or entering his presence magnifies him. And guess what? It's for our joy. God delights in the fact that we enter into his presence. So he gives us joy and he gets all the glory. And so what do we do? We, 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 draw, we draw near by, by submitting ourselves to him. And we have the privilege to, to enter him into his presence every day, just trusting in his work. The only reason we can enter his presence is because of Jesus' work. 
And so we don't have to enter his presence with fear. Our confidence, is, our confidence is because Jesus went on our behalf. And so this is, this is active. We draw near to him by spending time with him. It, this is, it's just basic, simple fellowship with God. So this is, it can happen in the morning, it can happen in the evening. Uh, we're going to give you time at the end of the service, it can happen now. Like where, wherever it is, God is inviting you into his presence. And so, and so this is, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a physical act. Like you're not showing God like, okay, for me to get in here, here's my resume, here's all the achievements, here's all the things I've done. Because guess what? Those things don't matter. You're directing the attention and focus of your heart and mind into his presence. And so, yeah, you can, you can pray, you can, you can read scripture, you can listen to, to worship music, uh, you, can, you, can do, you can do those things that help you, but more so, it's about aligning the posture of your heart uh, with, with his presence. Because it's not something that's supposed to be difficult or burdensome. It's what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, hey, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy. My, my burden's light. And so we can draw near confidently when we're sick, when we're tired, when we're hurting, when we have celebrations. Like whatever it may be, we can enter his presence confidently. It's an act of surrender, and he's faithful, and he's going to meet us where we are. And so if we're grateful, not only for what he's done, but what he's going to continue to do, because he serves us now, and he's going to continue to meet our needs. And so we draw near. We draw near because we know what he's done. But we also know we're confident when we hold fast. We hold fast to the gospel. Verse 23, follow along with me. Let us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We hold fast to the gospel. It's the gospel confession. We're, we're saved because we believe Jesus died on our behalf and rose from the dead. And we don't waver. Verse, verse 26, he, he lists this specific sin, and the, the specific sin is, is apostasy. And so for, for clarity, this is not a believer who just struggles with sin. You're like, that, sh that should just give us relief. We're like, whew, okay, great. Apostasy is the rejection of Christ by one who actually claimed to be a Christian. And they intentionally and willfully just abandon their faith. And so verses 32 through 34 give, give us a glimpse of what these believers were facing and why this started to set in. Like they were targets of abuse. They were targets of, of persecution. But what, what he says, he's like, hey, you joyfully accepted plundering. Because it showed an actual, it shows the maturity in their faith. But over time, they began to believe an idea that was planted inside them unbelief. Yeah, Jesus did all that, but this, you know, that's not good enough. Like if, it, if that were true, like then we wouldn't be facing all these problems around us. Like, isn't it just easier for me to go back? Like go back to Egypt? I mean, it's what the Israelites said in, in Exodus, if you've been following along. It's just easier. You see, unbelief calls God a liar. And so apostasy happened because they believed an idea. They believed a lie instead of the truth. And see, apostasy is the result of a bad idea. It happens because you can accept the lie that distorts the truth. Like evil comes in all all kinds of forms. Like we can, we should be able to just easily point out what's evil and what's not. But that includes ideas. And bad ideas are dangerous. It's like a, a group of filmmakers sitting around a table and they've had some really good projects and they've had some really good movies come out and they've, they've, they've had some success along the way. 
and they want to make a new movie. And one, it just, because all it takes is one. And one says, hey, what if we, what if we made a movie about a tornado with sharks? <laughs> and that's how Sharknado was born. You didn't know you were going to get a Sharknado reference this morning, did you? I think it's Shark Week too, by the way, but it's the idea that led to the result. We hold fast the confession. So what do we do? We, we believe the gospel. We must preach the gospel to ourselves every single day day. My works are not sufficient. My performance does not give me worth. My worth is found only in Christ. Your confidence is only found in Christ. His work is sufficient. So again, no matter what's swirling around you, whether it's, it's, it's sickness, whether it's cancer, uh, whether it's, it's, it's a job loss, it's death, it's famine, whatever it might be, we remain confident because of who he is, because of what he's done. So you can't place your identity in something that can be taken away. That's what C.S. Lewis says. Even the Hebrews writer, he says, hey, don't throw away your confidence. Verse 35, he says, don't, don't throw that away. You stand firm by believing the gospel. Don't exchange the gospel for a lie just because your circumstances may be bad. So are you standing firm? Are you holding on? Hold fast. Hold on to the gospel. Finally, when we're confident, we can confidently stir up each other. We're able to draw near, we're able to hold fast, and we're able to stir up one another. The verb is actually consider. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works in verse 24. It says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, we have a responsibility to each other. There's a corporate responsibility. A responsibility. These believers need help. The church must help those who are struggling. We can't be just focused on our own individual needs. Because look, we can get stirred up about a lot of different things. And he says, stir each other. He says, spur on is what the NIV says. Spur on each other toward the right things, toward gospel things. And to do that, we've got to be committed to each other. See, we have to be committed to gathering. Some of these readers were neglecting to meet, and the result limited their ability to provide and receive encouragement. And so what's added at the, verse, at the end of verse 25 is this, is this, sense, of, is this sense of urgency. He's like, you need to meet because, because work needs to be done before Christ's return. Like they, these believers believed Jesus was coming back any minute, any minute and so they weren't going to spend their time, they were going to waste their time on other things that didn't matter. The writer here is saying like, hey, like let's go. Like people need to hear the gospel. We got work to do. Jesus is coming back. We got to tell everybody. And see, that's what should have provoked these believers to continue on faithfully. Because all of verses 26 through 31, what they show is just the final outcome of, of what happened when they, when they neglected to meet. No one is a self-sufficient Christian. We need each other. And it didn't happen instantly. They didn't stop meeting like one time. It's the result of the lies we listen to. You know, it, oh, it, it doesn't matter Ah, they don't need me. I've got work. That, that's a little more important right now. Or what, what about these? Like, well, they, they, they're not going to accept me. I don't belong. I don't really belong there. We have to remember the gospel. Because it's not that we can enter into God's space, but we can enter into spaces with each other. Our authenticity and transparency should not push others away. 
And that's really what the next generation is looking for. There's, there's research out there about churches in, uh, churches in the DFW area. Where they see these church, they see the church, the global church, as inauthentic, irrelevant, and unloving. We've got to be a space that allows us to enter, uh, that allows us to enter into conversations where we can be accepted, we can be loved. And so our confidence is actually we're, we're, we can draw on confidence from being with other believers. Because we're encouraged when we're together. I mentioned the, the, the NIV translation is actually, spur, uh, is actually spur each other on. But it's the idea of, of riding a horse. I don't do that, okay? Does anybody else do that in here? Does anybody, anybody ride horses? We've got a couple over here. Okay, great, all right? So I'll let you come give the illustration if you would like. But when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're wearing spurs and you're riding a horse, like you're giving commands to the horse. And what you're doing is you're saying, hey, let's keep going. Hey, let's slow down. Hey, let's change directions. The same happens when, when we spur each other on. Like we can say, hey, let's keep going. Hey, let's not do that. Like, hey, let's, uh, let's, we're going to go a different way. What it does more, more than anything is it helps us stay in the fight. It helps us stay in the race. Because we have work to do. We must work with the relentless urgency. It's what Jesus says in John 9, 4. Night cometh. One day this is going to end. In the meantime, work for the gospel things. And so what do we do? There's a couple things we do. We, 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 gather, we gather, but we gather in groups and we gather in trainings. Again, because of Jesus, we can enter into fellowship with one another. And so here's what I'm going to say. Don't, don't isolate yourself. Don't cut yourself off from other people. And if that's, if, that's, if that's something you're struggling with, like, please, come find us. Like, come talk to me. I, I would love to just find people, find your group. Because, because again, no one is a self sufficient Christian. We, we've got groups for all different kinds of stages and phases of, of life. We've got, we've got grief share. We've got divorce care. We, we've got nearlywed and newlywed groups. We've got marriage core. We've got other groups on Sunday morning for, for our students. If you're a student or you're a parent of a student and you're going like, man, like, like they, they need connection. We, we have those too. We have crew uh, that meets during the week in homes. We've got groups here on, on Sunday morning with adults that actually help spur your kid on to follow Jesus. Because they can't do it alone. See, the purpose is for encouragement and to stir each other, uh, stir each other up for love and for good works. Love is what happens inside, right? We, we, we feel loved. We, we know we're loved. And so our response is Good works. Our response is doing the gospel things. Serving our community. Encouraging one another. So we gather in groups, but we also gather in training. So this is why we have trainings. You heard Taylor mention a minute ago, this is why we have a, a next-gen leader training on, on August 6th. Because we want you to be equipped on how to equip the next generation. We've got other trainings. If you're going to be on the welcome team or you, you're, you're thinking about being on the welcome team, there's a welcome team training coming up. Coming up. But we'll have another connect training in, in September. Why? Because we believe that we want to stir each other up for the gospel. We want to stir each other up for, for encouragement. We just want you to be equipped. Because we need each other. We need each other. And so how do you know you're confident? You're, you're able to draw near. You hold fast to the gospel. And you stir up one another. But I get it. You might still be sitting there going like, man, well, okay, what, like, what if I'm not confident? Like, what, what, if I, what if I'm struggling with this, this imposter syndrome? What if I don't feel like I belong? What if I, what if I struggle with this whole idea of, of unbelief? Well, 
My daughter's nine. She, her name's Zoe. I, I mentioned earlier this summer that she made a decision to follow Jesus uh, at BBS this summer, which we're celebrating and we're walking through and uh, we're talking about baptism, which is the next step after you, uh, after you receive Christ. And so she was asking me, she said, hey, she, she knew I was preaching this week. And she said, hey, like, what, uh, what are you preaching on? I said, well, I'm, I'm, we're preaching out of Hebrews. I'll be in Hebrews 10. And we're talking about what it means to have confidence. And my nine-year-old looked at me and she said, she says, Dad, I don't know if I believe. I told her, I said, that, I said, kiddo, I said, that's okay. I said, you know why? That's all of us. We all struggle with this. We're all battling this. None of us belong. It's only through faith, it's only through faith in Jesus that allows us to enter into his presence confidently. And so what do we do? The irony is the fact that it's the same three points. We draw near. We draw near to God. Like you're never too far gone. God, God in his mercy and his grace allows you to enter into his presence. And even if you feel lifeless, you feel apathetic, you feel like, man, I don't, I don't know how I feel right now. I don't, I don't get all this. You enter in, you have a conversation with him because he accepts you. He accepts your, your, your prayers. He accepts your, that conversation. He accepts your feelings and says, hey, you're okay because you're with me. You've been covered by the blood of the lamb. And then you hold fast to that confession. You hold fast to the gospel, to the good news. And you don't waver. And then you take that story, that how you feel, and you take that and you stir up in somebody else the gospel. Because the chances are that you're, somebody else is feeling the same way you do. And through your story, you're going to provide some encouragement. So here in a second, we're going we're gonna to sing. And we're going to sing King of Kings. And we're going to declare that he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords because of what he's done. He's, he's, we, can, we can go to him confidently. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is I'm going to invite you to enter into his presence. You can draw near to God right now. You can stay in your seat. You can stand. Maybe that looks like you're, you're singing along. You can come up here and you can pray at the, at the front. I'll be down here. I'd be happy to pray with you as well. But what this is, is an invitation for you to enter into his presence. Because God's going to hear your prayer. And God's going to minister to your needs. And so we draw near. We hold fast. And when we leave this place, we're going to stir up at each, each other for love and good works. Because our confidence is not found in what we do. Our confidence is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's pray. God, we enter your, your presence now, and I, I pray for, for, for those who might be just, just struggling with this idea of, of unbelief or struggling with just, uh, just what it means to follow you. That, God, you invite us into your presence because of what your son Jesus has done. And we can confidently enter into your presence and you welcome us. So God, as we, as we sing, as we pray, as we, uh, maybe as we just sit in silence, God, would you meet us where we are? And God, would you stir in us the gospel? And God, will you help us with our unbelief? We love you. Amen.